Hello, I'm Alec Avdekov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. How is it already August? Anyway, I hope everyone is doing well in these strange times. So do not forget that the best way to support this podcast is to help fund me on Patreon. The link to that is in the show notes below. Feel free to also follow me on social media and reach out to me. I absolutely love hearing from everyone. Here's a bit of news. I'm going to make the 50th episode a Q&A episode. My supporters on Patreon will of course have the first priority, but make sure that your questions are only about what has been discussed so far on the podcast. So, sadly, if you have any questions about the Seven Years' War or Frederick the Great later on down the line, I simply cannot answer. Email me or reach out to me on social media and your questions shall be answered. However, let's jump right into the recap of the last episode. In the last episode, Voltaire played spy and diplomat and visited Frederick's capital for the first time. Frederick's military, specifically the cavalry, went under crucial reforms, and, most critical to this episode, Frederick agreed to rejoin the War of Austrian Succession on the side of the French alliance after about two years of intense behind-the-scenes horse trading. Frederick's main army would attack Bohemia through neutral Saxony and there would be other attacks through Silesia. This would risk Saxony joining the Austrian side, but Frederick decided it was a risk worth taking. If he can strike with precision and swiftness, the war would be over, and there would be no need for Saxony to join the war in the first place. If Saxony would be unlikely to enter the war, Frederick assumed that her ally, the Russian Empire, would also not join the war against Prussia. We will eventually go more into depth about the Russian situation during the War of Austrian Succession, but here is the rapid-fire version. From 1735 to 1739, the Russian Empire under Empress Anna, who was the daughter of Peter the Great, was at war with the Ottoman Empire. Anna then died of a kidney stone at age 47 and left a two-month-old Ivan VI as the new Tsar in 1740. So Ivan VI was Tsar for about a year until November of 1741 when Elizabeth Petrovna overthrew the baby in a coup. Russia was also involved in a war with Sweden from 1741 to 1743 that was separate from the War of Austrian Succession. During this time, Russia was not involved in the affairs of Central Europe because its resources were spread far too thin. However, the Russian threat to Frederick's newfound power was always looming. That is why it was a fairly big shock that Empress Elizabeth of Russia began asking Frederick for help to find a new bride for her heir, Peter. Frederick recommended the young daughter of Elizabeth of anhalt zerbst named Sophia Catherine. Who knows, Sophia Catherine, a Prussian in the Russian imperial court, may be useful to Frederick in the future. So, in Frederick's mind, it seemed unlikely that Russia would join the war against him. For extra security, Prussia signed an offensive alliance against the Habsburg Empire on June 5, 1744. Now, the only thing that is left for him to do is to plan and pull off his invasion of Bohemia. For today's episode, I will heavily rely on Christopher Duffy's book titled The Military Life of Frederick the Great. This quote from Duffy perfectly illustrates Frederick's original intentions when planning this scheme. Duffy writes, quote, Frederick's intentions for the coming campaign was to make directly for the Bohemian capital Prague, seize it, and then establish himself in western Bohemia before Prince Charles and the Austrian army could return from the Rhine. The Prince Charles in question was the brother-in-law of Empress Maria Theresa of the Habsburg Empire. Charles of Lorraine also famously commanded the Austrians in their defeat in the Battle of Chotusitz. As of June 5, 1744, when the Franco-Prussian alliance was signed, Prince Charles of Lorraine was facing off against the French along the Rhine River in Western Europe. Frederick saw how an invasion of Bohemia would be nearly unopposed 
and must have licked his lips at the prospect of more land and glory in the coming campaign. The Prussian cavalry had been drilled and trained mercilessly since the end of the First Silesian War, and was no longer the inexperienced mass that stood still in the snow at Molwitz. The infantry were more experienced in combat and feared their officers more than the enemy. There is one little thing, however, that I would find worrying if I were to plan a campaign of this magnitude. According to Duffy's book on the military history of Frederick the Great, there was only enough supplies for, quote, a matter of weeks. Frederick was so confident that this campaign would be done and dusted with in a short matter of time that he neglected one of the most important aspects of military life, logistics. You will hear this quote from me in this podcast at least a hundred more times. Amateurs talk tactics, whereas professionals discuss logistics. One can foresee a possible disaster if the campaign lasts for a longer time than Frederick anticipates. But there's no room for pessimism in Frederick's army. In Frederick's mind, the campaign would last only a few months and would undoubtedly end in a victorious battle to conclude the war with Austria. Not only would Prussia have a little defensible empire, which would include the strategic mountain passes leading into Bohemia, but Frederick would be absolutely covered in fame and glory of two successful wars. For Fritz, victory was inevitable. In this so-called victory march, Frederick would command the main army of 40,000 troops and would march as quickly as possible through neutral Saxony to have the shortest and easiest route to the Bohemian capital, Prague. The old Dessauer, Leopold I of Anhalt-Dessau, would command roughly 15,000 troops in the area of Zittau. The old Dessauer was one of King Frederick Wilhelm's most famous soldiers. However, during the First Silesian War, Frederick did not use the old Dessauer as he wanted to fight without any, quote, tutors. Anyway, Field Marshal Schweren would command about 16,000 soldiers in Silesia, around the county of Glatz. These three columns would converge on Prague with great speed, The key to success in Frederick's mind was speed. If Prussia could catch Austria's defenses off guard, then Bohemia would be up for the taking. Frederick mobilized his troops in those three great columns and advanced with the main army into Saxony on August 12, 1744. The commander of the advanced guard using light cavalry was Hans Joachim von Zieten. Zieten commanded about 1,300 hussars, and acted as the scouting party for the Prussian advance. The main army under Frederick would only take 11 days to reach the Bohemian border on the 23rd of August. Then, after hard and exhausting marches, the three Prussian columns met on the outskirts of Bohemia's capital on the first week of September 1744. Christopher Duffy writes this about the Austrian defense of Prague. He states, quote, Prague was a large city, but weakly fortified, and more than three quarters of the total garrison of 18,000 men were made up of unreliable militia and civic guards. In short, Prague stood no chance against the massive Prussian army outside its walls. On September 16, 1744, the Austrian commander of the city surrendered unconditionally. It is after this success where I believe Frederick caught a disease that has killed many men in the quest for military glory. This debilitating illness is known as victory disease. The original idea was to take Prague and solidify his grasp on his newly conquered territory. But Frederick was pressured by his allies France and Bavaria to advance further south into Bohemia to possibly cut off the communications of Prince Charles of Lorraine. Frederick could have said no to his allies. Remember, he had backstabbed France a few times during the First Silesian War, and if he was truly convinced he should not go further south, he could have easily have said no. Instead, he gathered some troops and sent a section of fast-moving soldiers on September 19th to quote, reduce Tabor, September 23rd, 
Budweis September 30th, and the Castle of Frauenburg October 1st. The slower moving main army, personally led by Frederick, advanced south from Prague on September 21st. The fact is that Frederick had no clue where the heck the rest of the Austrian army in Bohemia was. Then, on the 25th of September 1744, Frederick heard some pretty bad news. Saxony had switched sides and joined the Austrians. As much as the Italians have a bad reputation for switching sides in war, Saxony in the 18th and 19th century probably switched sides more often. Saxony pledged 20,000 troops to join the forces of Prince Charles against Frederick's army. On the 27th of September, Frederick's main army reached the town of Tabor, the main base of one of the most successful military commanders of all time, Jan Zizka. However, rough terrain and autumn rains forced the Prussian army to halt until October 1st. October's news proved to be even more devastating for Frederick's supposed swift campaign into Bohemia. As Frederick continued to advance further south, his army's communications and supply lines continued to get longer and less secure. The entire time, Frederick was almost entirely clueless of where the rest of the Austrian army in Bohemia was. This was also true of the location of Prince Charles's army, who had turned around and was on a mad dash to Bohemia. But on October 2nd, a report was given to Frederick that shed some light on the subject. Prince Charles was said to be already in Bohemia and advancing on Budweis. Side note for the American audience. Budweis is indeed the town that the beverage Budweiser is named after. Anyway, two days after that disastrous news, Frederick's army made its way to Zaborsch, and there was no knowledge of where the Austrian army was. The Austrians had in fact united its forces, and there was now a 50,000 men strong army roughly 25 miles north of Frederick's army. The state of the Prussian army was not a good one. Imagine a turtle with its neck sticking out of its shell. One single blow to the neck would kill the turtle. Frederick was deep inside enemy territory and was in danger of having his supply cut off and becoming surrounded. That is why, on October 9, 1744, Frederick ordered a retreat, first towards Tabor and then to regain communications with Prague. This entire time, the Austrians were maximizing their situation while also refusing to be baited into fighting a battle against the tactically superior Prussian army. Good old Fabian tactics for you Roman Republic fans. The Austrians then went on a raid to strike Prussian logistics and gathered as much fodder as possible at Beneschau. This base was midway between Frederick's retreating army and Prague. This strike had the twin benefits of increasing the strength of your supplies by increasing the overall health of your horses, and it also denied the same to the Prussian army. Throughout this entire time, Austria had been practicing a sort of guerrilla-style warfare against the invading Prussians using hit-and-run tactics with Hungarian and Croat light forces. In short, the Prussian army was being bled out by a thousand cuts. However, one small positive event for the Prussian army took place when Field Marshal Schwerin, the same man who commanded the second half of the Battle of Molwitz, regained Beneschau on October 17th. However, that one single bright spot did not change the overall horrible state of the Prussian army. It was late fall in Eastern Central Europe. You know what that means, right? Freezing your tuchus off. In order to get some sort of shelter, the Prussians began to build makeshift straw-roofed huts. But this came at a cost. This allowed the Austrians to pick an incredible spot for defense and beef it up even further. The Austro-Saxon camp was at a place called Marshovitz. An ironic name considering it was an area that consisted of marshy ponds, fields, meadows, and hills full of trees. Not only was the geography against the Prussians, but so were numbers. On the 22nd of October, Prince Charles was joined by the Saxon army at Marshovitz, meaning that Frederick was outnumbered by 10,000 men. The Prussians 
would have to be literally insane if they wanted to attack this extremely well defended fortification. But do you know what Frederick did? This is absolutely gonna blow your mind. Are you ready? When he received the reports that to attack this camp would be a suicide mission, he didn't believe it. He personally rode out to look at the Austrian camp on October 25th. He was personally able to get a fairly good view of the Austrian position, but Frederick, <laughs> that rascal, he ordered, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, Frederick actually agreed and ordered a retreat towards Prague. Spoiler alert, but the Frederick of the Seven Years' War would more than likely have attacked the Austrian camp at Moschewitz. Anyway, the retreat began later on October 25th, 1744, and was much like Napoleon's later retreat from Russia. Cold, chaotic, and deadly. The Prussian garrisons of Budweis, Frauenburg, and Tabor had all fallen two days before on the 23rd. Frederick lost 3,000 men in this abandonment of southern Bohemia. This is when the real trouble began for the ordinary Prussian soldier. See, it was getting colder and food was as scarce as a drop of water in the Sahara Desert. If you wanted any food, you would have to scout it out or steal from villagers. However, the countryside was absolutely crawling with Austrian light cavalry that would kill you on sight. So, Foraging for food was less and less successful and losses were higher because of the cavalry raids. But you're not just dying from the sword, but also from germs. That's right, disease was ravaging its way through the retreating Prussian army, with commanders known as typhus and dysentery causing more to damage the Prussians than Prince Charles or Field Marshal Traun. Frederick was now cut off from his original path of advance because Saxony was now an enemy state. He therefore had to cut open a path right into Silesia by way of northeast Bohemia. The Prussian army was on the brink of disaster when a battle was fought near the town of Kutenburg on November 7th, 1744. The Austro-Saxon army, however, did not commit their full army and Frederick was able to have his army cross the upper Elbe River near Neukolin on the 8th and 9th of November. Frederick then scattered his troops north of the river because he believed that military operations were done for the winter. There was one small factor that Frederick did not count upon. The upper Elbe was only about 90 paces wide, and the Austrians could absolutely cross it. On November 19th, 1744, the Austrian army crossed the river near Telschitz and almost completely destroyed a Prussian grenadier battalion. This was a wake-up call for Frederick, and he packed things up and transported the six soldiers to the original Austro-Prussian border the very next day. Also on the 20th, Frederick sent some light troops to notify the commander of the army garrison at Prague to evacuate ASAP. Frederick retreated northeast towards the town of Königgeitz, and the Prussian army rested there for a while. But... The Hungarian Hussars and Croats caught up to the Prussians on November 27th. The Prussians lost about 200 more men in the area of Ples and Trautenau. For you 19th century Prussian history fans, Trautenau is definitely not a good place. Frederick and the men of the Royal Army made it back across the border into Silesia on December 8, 1744. There was still drama going on for the former garrison of Prague who had to retreat through Saxon territory to make it back to Prussian lines. But for all intents and purposes, the Prussian invasion of Bohemia was over. The overall losses for Prussia were absolutely mind-boggling. Remember that Frederick began the invasion with a little over 70,000 men in three columns. The total number of men who made it back to Silesia in December of 1744, according to Duffy's book, was about 36,000 men. According to the Austrians, 17,000 of these losses were soldiers who thought that they were better off deserting. And in many respects, who can blame them? The vast majority of Prussian deaths from this invasion were from disease, mainly due to a lack of supply. 
It was either a slow, gruesome death from disease or a painful death from a hussar's saber. So, yeah, it makes sense why so many Prussian soldiers deserted. I believe we shall have to round out today's episode with a quote that describes Frederick's overall strategic performance so far as the commander-in-chief of the Prussian army. I will simply let Christopher Duffy's words explain the situation as it was. Duffy writes, quote, In the strategic dimension, his record was still one of almost unrelieved failure. His rapid progresses in December 1740, February 1742, and September 1744 looked impressive enough on the map, but they amounted to little more than promenades into an empty countryside. Once the main Austrian army arrived on the theater of operations, Frederick was forced on every occasion to conform with strategic initiatives of the enemy. In short, Frederick can easily advance when there is no enemy around, but cannot perform as well whenever there is an actual army that faces him. Tactically, the Prussian army was still one of the best in Europe, but it had lost many quality soldiers in this campaign without any major battles. The Second Silesian War, on a purely military basis, did not look good, but on a geopolitical level, it looked a heck of a lot worse. Saxony had joined the war and it was possible that Russia might join as well. If the armies of Austria, Saxony, Hanover, which was in a personal union with Britain and was also in the alliance with Austria, and Russia all ganged up on Prussia, there would be no chance whatsoever for Prussia to hold out. Frederick was in a very tight spot. However, we shall have to wait until the next episode to see if Frederick will be able to get out of this jam. To end today's episode, I shall simply have to say, if you're planning an invasion of a Central or Eastern European state, just don't. That's all. <laughs>